You ready to get rolling here? We're live. I hope. You hear me, Tony? Tony? Yes, I can. Okay. Perfect. All right, we got a couple guys just. Can you hear me clear? Yeah, we can hear you. Like the voice of God. <laughs> Let me talk a little deeper. <laughs> <laughs> it's pretty loud. That that was your buddy, a nuclear machinist, mate, Tony. Oh, is that the is that knuckle dragger? A lot of guys made steam in this room, different ways. Yeah, a lot of fancy bowlers. I was just did it with that fission product. Yeah. Hot rocks make hot water, make steam water. So who was the boiler guys in here? Who was the Navy? That's Terry and myself. Terry's the one I told you was on a raid, Tony. I forgot what you were on. I was on Stonewall Jackson. In the uh, boomer boat. I think I got parts off of that boat one time. So are we ready to begin? Uh, yeah, I think so. We just got a couple guys grabbing some last minute food here and uh, we'll get started. Um, I can't hear a word you're saying. You can hear Tom in the back of the room, but you can't hear me. <laughs> it's probably coming from it's the, the mic. It's, it's in the camera. Oh, the mic's in the camera. Yep. Oh, okay. Got you. All right, the camera's all the way across the room. <laughs> I hear you clearly now. <laughs> Uh, he's facing you now instead of the wall. I thought it was the microphone on my laptop. Your name. your name dropped out of your room. Oh, really? Yeah. 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 Glue that in there. Hit forward. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> That's some gum? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <sighs> Tony, thanks for joining us tonight in a manner of speaking. <laughs> I apologize for the mix-up, but we'll make it work. You'll get the same information. Where you at? Somewhere tropical? Pittsburgh. <laughs> that explains it. <laughs> Wait a minute, hold on. You want tropical? Tony Anthony, isn't that Tony twice? There you go. Is that better? There you go. Uh, looks good. It looks like a golf course in Vegas. <laughs> Uh, I, I could put the Clemson background up, but I figured the Ohio State fans wouldn't like that one. Probably not. <laughs> well, they won this year. This year they would like it. They won, finally. All right. So, um, just a quick introduction. I think everybody, uh, Tom's probably, I know, mean, posted a little bit of biography on me. Um, if y'all hear, hear me, you'll understand I'm not from Pittsburgh, even though I live here. I'm from a little bit further south called South Carolina. I've been in Pennsylvania for 30 something years now. I've actually been in Pennsylvania longer than I was in South Carolina. Former Navy Duke operated in sub, uh, electric plant on submarine. I've been in the motion industry for 20 something years and I've been uh, the Escawa regional sales engineer for eight and a half years now. Um, most of my background is more industrial. so. Really up until the last eight and a half years, I've uh, started learning more and more about the uh, commercial side of the, of the uh, forcing for drives. 
they work the same whether they're moving a conveyor or they're turning a rooftop unit. Uh, I'm pretty low key, so if you got questions, holler at the screen. You know, I'll pause whatever I'm doing. We can talk. And what we're going to do tonight is go through some basics of drives, and we'll start with a, a video that uh, from our training department that um, is really, even though it's a Yaskawa video, it's what's in this is the basics of a drive. And I'll probably pause it here at a couple points. And if you've got any questions during the video, speak up and I'll pause it. We can answer them during the video. And then from there, we'll go into some presentation on the, what you, what a drive looks like, what's before the drive and what's after the drive, different things you can use to uh, make the drives work better. And then we'll go into some basics of troubleshooting and if there any questions you guys have. Hey, any questions for us, Hart? Yeah, I got one. Um, do you have any way of recording this? Was that you, Adam, again? I can hit oh, the, I can start sorry. recording yeah, right now. All right, we're recording. All right, thanks. All right, so what I'm gonna start with is, hopefully everybody can see this, we'll see this clearly. You can see, um, you should see a YouTube video. Yes? No, not yet. No video. Still seeing the home screen with the Yaskawa basics. You seeing it now? No, nope. nope. not yet. All right, we have it on the, oh, wait a minute. You know, you got to really share your video, gentlemen, if you're going to do this professionally. you got to share your screen. He's telling you. Hi, bye. Oh, no. All right. right. There he is. There he is. There he is. There he is. All right. You know, this is your Skyward video. Like I said, everything they're putting here is, is comparable to pretty much any drive out there. Got any questions? Holler it out during the video. The Technical Training Department of Yaskawa America Incorporated presents Variable Frequency Drive Basics. Have you ever thought about what goes on inside of the Variable Frequency Drive? After all, when you stop and think about it, these mysterious boxes are really pretty remarkable. They help us save energy, reduce maintenance of machines, and they give us nearly infinite control over almost any type of process powered by a three-phase AC motor. So how exactly do variable frequency drives or VFDs work? What do you need to know about? I'm Steve Kaler. Welcome to the second video of our two-part series on motors and drives. In part one, you were introduced to the basics of three-phase AC electrical motors. Today, we are going to look at the basics of VFDs or variable frequency drives. You may also know them as adjustable speed drives, adjustable frequency drives, AC drives, and inverters. Whatever you call them, what's important is what goes on inside them and how we use them to control and monitor electric motors. In this presentation, before we look inside of a drive, we'll start with the many applications for variable speed drives, both industrial and commercial. We'll look at other starting methods, ways to start a motor that don't utilize a drive, and next, we'll talk about the purpose of variable speed drives, why we use them. We'll then walk through the typical layout and construction of a drive and explain the components that make up this device. We'll look at different types of enclosures, and then to wrap things up, we'll review this presentation with a few questions. Now, before we look at the inner workings of a drive, Let's examine the applications that could benefit from the drive. Industrial applications often require very precise control. In the past, these applications relied on complicated gearing and clutches to control the speed of a given system. Examples would include conveyors, cranes and hoists, presses, winders and unwinders, high-speed machining applications, as well as many others. Now in the commercial market, we are normally trying to achieve a given flow and pressure. This changes depending on the demand at any given time. Fans use inlet guide vanes, bypass dampers, or outlet dampers for flow control. Pumps use discharge valves or bypass valves to regulate pressure. Cooling towers would use a mixture of two. 
Using a variable frequency drive for these types of industrial and commercial applications allows us to remove mechanical speed, flow, and pressure control systems that may prove difficult to regulate and could possibly be failure points. Instead, the drive easily adjusts speed and torque to given system demands. Now, on top of that, some variable torque commercial applications can take advantage of affinity laws and use the least amount of energy to meet the given flow or pressure demand. This can lead to energy savings that can have the drive system paying for itself within a short period of time. As we explained in Motor Basics, three-phase induction motors, when applied across the line, run in a narrow speed range, depending on load and motor characteristics. On their own, they're either on or off. However, motor drive systems are often incorporated to allow the system to operate at a wide range of speeds while still producing full load torque if needed. The simplest form of control is a manual motor start, which is nothing more than a means to manually open and close the contacts to start and stop the motor. Manual motor starters usually include some type of motor overload protection. A magnetic motor starter is similar to a manual starter, except you can remotely toggle a magnetic coil to bring in contacts as needed. A drawback both manual and magnetic motor starters is that they do not reduce the inrush current that the system will experience at startup. Primary resistor starting uses resistors to reduce the voltage going to the motor. After a given time, the resistors are bypassed and full voltage is then applied to the motor. These resistors will get hot and have a limited duty cycle. In other words, a limited number of start stops in a given period of plugs. With auto transformer starting, we are tapping the transformer at different points, resulting in a change in voltage. After the motor is started, the transformer is bypassed. With Y delta starting, we connect the motor at start in a Y configuration, which exposes each coil to a lower voltage, then switches over to delta while the motor is in the running state. SCR or thyristor control. The solid state device is controlled to pass only a portion of the voltage waveform to the motor. These offer a smooth start to the given system and limit the current draw by the motor. When the motor is up to full speed, the unit then bypasses the soft start function and full voltage is applied. These units have limited start allowances for a given time period, but offer smooth starts instead of the stepped previous methods. So that brings us to the purpose of variable frequency drives. Here are some of the major capabilities a drive provides. If you viewed the Motor Basics presentation, you saw this diagram showing an induction motor's relationship between speed and torque. By adding a drive to the system, we have the ability to alter the speed toward curve. This lets us take advantage of the motor's characteristics at multiple speeds, instead of being limited to only 60 hertz. VFDs allow us to match the speed of the motor-driven equipment to the load requirement. Operating a motor with a VFD provides full torque capability over a wide range of frequencies. Having full torque available allows us to use a standard or a general purpose motor in many more applications and situations than we would otherwise be able to. Furthermore, we can limit the output torque of a motor for a given application or point in the process should it be required. Since we now can control the motor, we can program our own acceleration and deceleration or XL and decel times. Now this will vary depending on the application. For example, a fan can utilize longer XL and B-cell times, so the motor draws a low amount of current, reducing energy consumption and associated belt wear. On the other hand, some industrial applications require fast response, which calls for very short XL and B-cell times. Built-in motor protection eliminates the need for external motor protection. In variable torque applications, savings can be seen due to the affinity laws. 
A small reduction in speed can lead to a dramatic decrease in power usage. We can generate torque at zero speed to hold or lock the rotor, a feature previously limited to servos and mechanical brakes. On the other side of the table, we can now overspeed and run at speeds above 60 hertz, provided the motor is able to accommodate that speed. Remote monitor control means that you can monitor and control the system from your desk or from anywhere in the world where you have an internet connection. We are now going to explain how this device actually works. As we go through each component, we'll explain what it's doing and how. Together, the components make a three-phase electric motor turn and produce usable work. The three major drive components are control, power, and the main circuit. We'll start with control. For most drives, the operator uses a digital keypad to program the unit for the given application and in some cases to operate the drive locally via the keypad. Things like overloads, XL and D-cell rates, minimum and maximum speed, and many other parameters can all be set through the keypad. For a user looking for some more advanced setups, there are option cards that can be added, which include communication options, feedback encoders, and extended inputs and outputs. For controlling purposes, the user can wire into the digital inputs and outputs and analog inputs and outputs. The I.O. terminals also support some communication protocols. Finally, we get to the control. Now think of this like the brain of the drive. It takes information from the user and drive components and relays the given information or tasks to appropriate areas as required. Let's look at the selectable control methods the drive comes with. These different methods are programmed by the operator into the control board. Depending on your applications and needs, you will want to choose the control method that best fits your requirement. Hello? Yes, sir. As we move through each of these methods, control becomes better and better. VF, or voltage by frequency control, is the simplest method. Well, this follows a set pattern, increasing voltage as frequency increases. It's great for fans and pumps, but it's also very good for applications that do not need tight speed regulation of the motor. When adding a pulse generator or PG feedback device, the speed regulation becomes tighter and the drive actually knows the speed and the direction of the motor. A PG is commonly referred to as an encoder. Open loop vector control is a step up from VF and is great for dynamic motor control and can produce higher torque levels at lower frequencies. This method can also limit torque output. It's great for conveyors and most other general industrial applications. Closed loop vector control uses an encoder or PG to give instantaneous feedback to the drive. This allows the drive to be used in true torque control mode. This is great for winders, rewinders, and web applications. Zero speed motor control is also possible. Control methods available for PM or permanent magnet motors may also be available. This motor is similar to the induction motor we talked about before, except the rotor now incorporates magnets to create the rotor's magnetic field instead of the typical shorted rotor bars. Moving from the control side deeper into the drive, we find ourselves at the main power board. This separates the high and low voltage areas, converting signal levels to something the control board can read and output to. This is used for monitoring critical areas of the drive as well as control levels. The main circuit is where all the heavy lifting takes place. The heavy transformation of power most drives now use the same main is in a way from left to right, building our drive and understanding the components along the way. Starting at the input of the drive, the first device that the incoming line will see is the MOVs or metal oxide resistors. 
These resistors are in place to take on any incoming voltage transients or spikes, such as switching transients associated with relay and contact or energization and de-energization. When these resistors come into contact with a high spike, they allow the spike to bleed off to another line and travel safely back out to the incoming line, thus suppressing the spike and protecting the more expensive components in the drive. Well, this brings us to the input diodes or input converter, or commonly known as the rectifier. Most drives today perform a full wave transformation, which means these diodes chop the AC line and create a DC supply. That is the first of the three major components in the drive. The voltage output from the rectifier is then refined by a filter circuit consisting of large capacitors and in some cases, a DC link choke. In any system using a combination of a rectifier and a filter, capacitors may result in discontinuous current draw. But this results in harmonics being reflected back on the incoming line. Yaskawa has a video titled Harmonics that further explains this topic and ways to mitigate harmonics. The components between the rectifier and the filter capacitors comprise a soft charge circuit. When you apply power to the drive, the unit must safely power up. This happens relatively fast, but we must slowly charge the capacitor to the drive. An uncharged capacitor will act like a short if full voltage is applied to it instantly. This is not desirable because the inrush current may be too high for the rectifier and upstream supply components. Therefore, we use a soft charge circuit to slowly charge the capacitor. The soft charge circuit is made up of a contactor and a resistor. A resistor limits the current flowing to the capacitor. After the capacitor charges, the contactor closes and bypasses the resistor. Remember, electricity, like most of us, will follow the path of least resistance. Once the DC bus capacitors are charged, they act like a storage tank for the drive. The capacitor stores voltage for the system. These capacitors also have a smoothing effect for rectifying power. This smoothing reduces the peaks and valleys of the three phase incoming power that has been rectified. This reduction in ripple helps reduce the wear on the system as a whole. It's also important to note that the voltage level in the drive is now changed by rectifying AC power. The new DC bus voltage can be calculated using this formula VDC equals the square root of two times the voltage of the incoming AC. We now move to the last major section of the drive, the output, or more specifically, the inverter section. The inverter section of the drive is comprised of IGBTs, which stands for insulated gate bipolar transistors. These work together to produce a simulated three-phase AC waveform for the motor. One IGBT will take power to build the upper part of the wave. Then another IGBT building the lower half of the wave. Now remember, we have a three-phase motor. So typically, three IGBTs are on at a given time to generate simulated AC voltage waveforms to the motor. These IGBTs have built-in diodes that allow current to flow in the opposite direction of the current flowing through the IGBTs, as may be encountered when turning the IGBTs off or when exposed to regenerative conditions. However, the rectifier blocks the regenerative energy from flowing back onto the line. This is also one reason why you might encounter an overvoltage trip Yaskawa does offer systems that have the ability to put power back onto the line. These units use different drive topologies that allow for regeneration. After the IGBTs come the DCCTs, or direct current current transforms. The DCCTs monitor output current on all three phases going to the motor. This can be used for control and motor protection. Let's explain how these IGBTs work together to build this three-phase power. The IGDTs are controlled using PWM or a pulse-width modulation scheme. 
The IGBTs are basically switches that work at a very fast rate. Since they are either on or off, the only thing we can change is the amount of time they are on or off. So to build this waveform at the beginning, we stay on for a very short period of time. Then we increase our on time relative to the base sine wave we are building from. After reaching the peak, we then start to reduce the on time until the zero point when another IGBT starts to turn on to create the inverted wave. You will notice that the voltage waveform is almost square, but is happening in the positive and negative regions. And that's because the IGBTs are pulling from a constant DC bus. Voltage reacts very quickly compared to current, which causes this block type output. The pulses are high in amplitude, but the RMS or root mean square voltage appears equivalent to the motor rated voltage. You will find motors that can handle this PWM style waveform tend to be labeled inverter duty on the main. Now, the rate at which IGBT switching occurs is known as the carrier frequency. This switching frequency can be adjusted if need be. Increasing the carrier will result in a cleaner, more sinusoidal current waveform, which in turn will make the motor generate less audible noise. However, this will also make the IGBTs work hard and create more heat in the drive. It may be necessary to derate the output current of the drive to accommodate for the increased carrier frequency. It's interesting to know that the reason a motor is louder when connected to a drive versus across the line is due to this switching frequency. The stator laminations in the motor vibrate, causing this audible noise. Increasing the carrier only brings that vibrating frequency to a level that becomes difficult for us to hear. And this leads to a less audible noise and a quieter motor. Decreasing the carrier will lead to the opposite characteristics. That is, there's more audible noise, but the IGBTs don't have to work as hard. As a result, we have a cooling running drive. You can see on the fundamental output frequency reference in blue reflects onto the actual output via this given carrier frequency. But we are finally brought to the output current wave for a given phase. As you can see, this looks sinusoidal. Well, remember that an induction motor is basically an elaborate inductor. And what do inductors mainly care about? That's right, current. And the drive is sending the motor a relatively nice and clean sine wave so it can do its job, which is to turn a shaft and produce work. Well, now that we've walked All right, can everybody hear me now? Yep. I'm stopping the video there uh, as we get into the closures. Any questions on what you saw in the video? We're going to kind of get into it a little bit more here now. I want I like that video because it kind of shows you how the drive works and how you build through the drive and kind of lays out how the components are in the drive. Any questions about any of that? Doesn't look like it. No. All right. All right, so now you can see, we're going to get into the basics of a drive and um, a little bit about what you can do before the drive, how the drive works, and then after the drive to take care of your uh, equipment. So, next we're going to cover what a VFD is. We're going to go a little bit more into how it controls the speed of a motor. Uh, we're going to talk a good bit about how it saves energy and which is one of the biggest reasons drives exist, especially in the commercial world. Uh, process control. And uh, then we're going to do a little bit of, like I said, intro to variable frequency drives. So basically, there's three sections of a drive if you kind of look at it. There's what is before the drive, what we how we can feed the drive, protect the drive, you know, the pre-power VFD section, 
Then there's the VFD section. And then we got after the VFD, between the VFD and the motor. So we'll start with the uh, pre-VFD section. Some of this, I know most of you guys are probably more technical. I'm, like, I'm gonna go through, some of this is pretty simple and we'll go through it quickly. Some of the others will cover a little bit more detail. Basically there's three things you can most, you normally would be using on the input before drive. One would be some type of circuit breaker, something to protect the drive. Um, in case of some kind of incoming short or something along that lines. Uh, you can use fuses. And then the other thing is some kind of harmonic mitigation device, uh, like a line reactor. Circuit breakers are pretty straightforward. Uh, they serve as a, basically a disconnect. They can give, provide you disconnect for the drive. Uh, they can also protect the drive. And what's nice about a breaker over a fuse, a lot of times people, you know, in the past we always use fuses because the old breaker technology didn't trip quick enough. Now we can use there's the new breaker technology with uh, some of the semiconductor breakers and stuff can trip fast enough to protect the drive and they're resettable. Unlike with a fuse, we have to replace it. All right, connections. Basically, yeah, this, this, this is some of the stuff I talk about where we're going to kind of go through this quickly. One thing I do want to talk about here is the uh, on the connections, one thing to think about with drives and with any electronic equipment. You know, as current flows through the electronic equipment, it creates heat. And one of the leading cause of failures of actually uh, uh, of electronic equipment from drives and, and, other, is, and other electronic equipment is actually loose terminals. If you think about it, every time that drive, that uh, current goes through there, you know, heats up, cools down, heats up, cools down. Over time, those connections and the lugs and stuff like that can slowly become loose. If you've ever gone in with a heat gun, you can see hot spots and it's usually due to loose connections. So one of the uh, things we recommend is after installing a drive, go back within a few months or a year or so and go back and re torque all the main connections so that you can make sure that the drive can handle that, that the drive is safe and been protected. So uh, just something to think about for troubleshooting of drives. Uh, loose terminals really can cause a lot of problems. Mm -hmm. Circuit breakers, nice thing about circuit breakers, they provide instantaneous strip rating, uh, approximately 10 times full load down to the device that is protecting. And then you can send a single pole, two pole, or three pole. And the reason this is important with a drive is we can do a single phase input to a drive. So if you've got an application where uh, you've only got single phase 240 available and you need to run and you want to run a three phase motor, we can do that. You would have a two pole breaker there. So that's something to think about. We can, if you've got any questions about that, we can discuss it. Uh, another way to protect the drive and uh, is incoming power fuses. Uh, Unlike a breaker, these trip, obviously they are, you have to replace them, a little more time consuming. But they can provide, a, they can protect the drive and so a lot of people still use them. I actually see people that like to use a breaker and fuses because they just, they've got to have fuses in the circuit and they also want a breaker. One thing to think about is, I've had this discussion for over with guys over the years, a 100 amp fuse is not a 100 amp fuse, and most of you, I'm sure, know that. But uh, there's still people out there that, yeah, it's a 100 amp fuse. I'll throw it in there, no problem. Well, there's different types of fuses. Make sure you've got the right type of fuse for your application. If you've got a, if you've got a fuse on a motor that's that's getting that inrush current, it's a different style of fuse than a quick trip. Then, so you need like a slow blower, fast blow. They all have a, a place to be. So. Make sure uh, if you're replacing a fuse, you are replacing it with a proper fuse for the application. Checking fuses, I can go over that. Obviously, you know that, take an all-meter, pull the fuse. One thing you wanna make sure you do do on a fuse, though, I will say this, a lot of people, and I've done it, we've all been guilty, put an all-meter across the fuse while it's still in there, and you read through parallel circuits, it looks like you got a, a good fuse. Make sure the fuse is out if you're gonna check it. All right, now we're gonna get into some of that, uh, to the line reactor. Line reactor does a lot of things for us on the input side of the drive. One of the number one things is harmonic 
uh, mitigation. Anything that takes AC and creates DC, whether it be your LED lighting, whether it be your battery chargers, uh, your computer systems, anything that takes AC and makes DC, the way we use the AC signal to convert, to convert that to DC, we uh, cause harmonic distortion on the input side. And that harmonic distortion can, over time, uh, it, it's additive. So if I had one drive today, then another drive later, then another drive later, eventually I'm going, each drive is adding distortion into the system. Each drive you calls, um, and it's, like I said, it's additive. I had a situation with this down in uh, Sugar Creek, Ohio, a dairy farmer. He had put in new, new energy efficient lighting. He had put in a bunch of other pumps and drives. Now he had two downwell pumps, 10 horsepower. He could start one and his, he had RFID tag readers in his cow's ears. And that way he would know which cows were coming in and being milked. If he, with no drives on, he would read 25 out of 25 every time. From one 10 horsepower drive on, he couldn't read them. He might get two or three out of 25. What was happening was the distortion from that drive was uh, was just enough to put him over the top. Because all the other stuff he had done, like the lighting and he had other drives in there, they got him close to where his transformer couldn't handle it. And we were the tipping point. And so if you're going into a building that's already got a lot of drives, it's something to think about because you may be the tipping point. And if you're the tipping point, it always then becomes your problem. It becomes the, well, we didn't have an issue until you put that in. Well, you were just under the tipping point where you were going to have issues and we put you over the top. And nothing we did to get the harmonic distortion down enough, he could turn on one of those 10 horsepower pumps and he did not want to add uh, any uh, line reactors or any kind of filtering or anything for the other equipment. So basically you end up having to run the pumps across the line because this could do it. One of the things we can do to minimize that though is we can throw a line reactor. A drive creates by itself about 88% harmonic distortions. So, but normally your transformer absorbs that and protects all the other equipment. But once again, the more drives you add, the more distortion, eventually the overheating in the transformer will get to a point that it can't protect the equipment. So what we can do with a line reactor, it takes that 88% and puts it down to somewhere between 30 and 40. So we actually cut the distortion in half. So you, that will protect your transformer, protect other equipment. And it'll, it'll mean you're further away from having the issues. Three main properties of induction for, for the, um, for the uh, line reactors, they oppose rapid change in current voltages. That's something that will help protect the drive. So if you have a brownout or a quick dip in power that or something that somebody runs a forklift into the building and causes a, a short and, and there's a, a current rush, in rush into the drive. This, the, that uh, is basically a big coil of wire. It will help protect the, protect the drive from that. And it, it also prevents any line noise. So if there's any other equipment out there, like a larger drive, something like that, that's causing distortion, the line reactors will protect this drive from any distortion caused from other drives. And then it prevents the noise from getting back onto the line, which I was discussing earlier. All right, now let's get to the VFD. So that's before the drive. Any questions on line reactor or fusing or anything along that lines, like when we use them, why we use them, thing along that lines? Nope, all right, let's move on. So let's get into the VFD, kind of like what we saw in the video. There's basically three main sections of the VFD. There's the input rectifier, converter section, and the pre-charge circuit. Uh, there's the DC bus capacitor and bank, and then the output. Uh, uh, converter transistor section. The diode bridge, and I like this drawing because it, can, it illustrates one thing. If you, your DC bus, if you remember he showed that big formula, like you can know what your DC bus is supposed to be. And the e, there's really just a simple rule of thumb. Your incoming voltage, uh, your DC bus voltage will be about 1.44 times that. So if you've got 240 coming in, I'm gonna pull out my handy dandy calculator here. 240 times 
you should be your DC bus voltage should be around 350, 345, 350, somewhere in that range. So that's a rule of thumb to remember. So your incoming voltage times 1.44 is what you should see on your DC bus. If you're not seeing that, uh, one thing you may want to do is check your diode bridge. There's an, and it's very easy. The diode bridge is very easy to check. You can actually check it with an ohm meter. So what you do, obviously make sure power's off the drive, disconnect the line, the leads coming in, and you can take your ohm meter, because these, these, this diode bridge, these, if you know anything about uh, diodes, they're nothing more than a fancy switch. They are either on or off. <clears throat> they allow flow in, uh, current flow in one direction and not the other. You block it the other. So what you can do, take your ohm meter, excuse me, sorry about that, I got a cough here. Take your ohm meter, put it on L1, and put it on the plus side of your DC bus. And then you reverse it. Your black and red leads, reverse them. One direction you'll see a short. The other direction you should see an open. If you see an open in both in both directions, you've got a bad diode, and you know you've got a problem with your diode bridge. So the real simple way, you do that for L1, L2, and L3 to the plus side of the bus, and you also do it to the minus side of the bus. Once again, open, all meter, a very simple way to check your diode bridge. So this diode bridge, which creates our DC bus, is a very simple way to check it. If you're having a problem on your DC bus and uh, you don't see the voltage you think you should see, check your DC bus, check the diode. You know you can see if you got a problem with the pre-charge so. <coughs> Excuse me. Or with the diode bridge. And as you said in the video, that you see that pre-charge uh, relay and there's a um, resistor in there. And that is in there so that um, when you first apply voltage and power to a, to a drive, the uh, DC bus capacitors, they are an instantaneous short. So we have that free charge relay with, there's a resistor in there to limit that inrush current while those, until those capacitors build up. And then once the capacitors build up, if you've ever been in front of a big drive, you hear that big clunk. About a second or so after the you put power on it, that is the uh, contactor around the pre charge uh, resistor kicking in to take the resistor out of the circuit because the capacitors are now charged up. So you got your diode bridge and pre-charge relay, um, which you can hear click in when you, when you uh, apply power, and that's on the input of uh, the uh, section. Here's the diodes. I always do this. I, I, I tell everything and go back and there's the uh, screens that say what I was saying. Uh, rectifier section, we're going to go through, we're going to skip through some of this quickly. SCRs are old technology. This is what you still will see in uh, soft starts. Um, and the biggest difference between a soft start and a drive is one, we can control the, the speed, you know, after, you know, at any time we can vary the speed. And also, I'm like, the other size is soft start. Soft start is you got a three, four, five hundred percent inrush still because both, we're, they're varying the frequency and the voltage is still at very high. So the soft start is um, uses SCRs. We no longer use those on drives. Recharge circuit. We already went through this about the capacitors limiting the inrush. Now we get to the, the capacitor section. This is the power. This is that DC bus. If you ever see it on any drive, if you're down at the bottom. There should be somewhere you should have a plus and minus, and sometimes you have two or three pluses and two or three minuses. That is the plus and minus of your DC bus. Uh, that's the, and that's what the uh, capacitors create that DC bus with uh, that we're seeing there. And once again, rule of thumb: 1.44 times your incoming voltage is what you should see between that plus and minus on your ohm meter when you're checking your DC bus voltage. So I had a quick question: Why? Is, sure. <clears throat> back to that last picture. So the DC bus voltage is 1.44, our normal AC voltage coming in. Is that because the, the capacitors are actually charging up to the peaks of the waveform and not the average? Uh, yes, yeah, because we're pulling the uh, power, we're pulling the DC bus. It's how, inherent in how we, we create that DC bus. We're pulling power off the top. If you look at an uh, AC sine wave. It shows in the just picture right here on the bottom. Yeah, right here at the bottom. Yeah. If you look at right here, we're only pulling power right off the top. See, off the peaks of the top and the bottom. You know, I've got the other side. Here we go. 
So we're only pulling power right here. Can you see my, my mouse? Right. And we're pulling it off the bottom here. So we're only pulling power from the peaks. And so yes, and, between, and then with the capacitor charging up, that creates the, uh, the elevated voltage for the DC bus voltage. It's not the RMS, it's, uh, it's the peaks. Cool. Any other questions? Nope, thank you. All right. This is going through the capacitors. All we're showing here is that as soon as you apply voltage, the uh, current is very high. It's like the inrush, that's when we have that pre-charge. You can see the time over voltage, so the capacitors charge up. I don't know if you had, ever, any of you were ever in any kind of electronics class or anything like that when you were in school or in the Navy. Take a small capacitor, charge it up and toss it to somebody so it discharges and shocks them, you know, stupid things we did back in the day. But this is showing you charging time. And this is what that pre-charge relay that you hear clunk in every time you apply power to the drive is once that capacitor is up in the, the green and is fully charged, we no longer need that. So it will... Um, that that takes the resistor out and uh, we don't have to worry about that anymore. Sorry, if somebody keeps dinging my phone, I gotta shut it off. Thought I had the volume down. Capacitors are made up of dielectric material. I won't skip through some of this cause I don't, you know, it's not the kind of stuff I even remember. DC bus, here we go. This is for a 460 system. Charge is 650, those 750 or 700. Um, the, on a 240 system, like it says to me, somewhere around 350. That's got the capacitor that's maintained at DC bus, and it also regulates the, uh, removes the ripple. Because we're pulling power from um, the tops and bottom of that uh, sine wave, it's actually kind of notch, a notch DC bus. The uh, capacitor's actually smoothed that out. And this is what you see here. What we do, we pull, this is like the peak of a sine wave. And then this, the one beside the second one in the middle would be the negative peak that we've inverted to create a DC bus. So without a capacitor, you would have, if you put a scope on it, it would just be that big ripple. It would never be a pure DC bus. And that ripple causes problems. Uh, so the capacitor actually will fill in the peaks and valleys by charging and discharging, you know, to fill in and smooth out. And that's how we create a solid stable DC bus. So if you put a scope on a drive and you're seeing a lot of like the green there with the ripples, you've probably got a, a, a capacitor that's on its way out because it's not able to maintain that DC bus. Or another thing you could, be, could have going on is single phasing. So like if, let's say you have a three phase drive, but you lost a phase and you didn't know it. The single phase input creates a lot of ripple on that DC bus. So if you put a scope on a DC bus and you see, you don't see a fairly smooth, you either got a capacitor that's going bad or you need to check your input and make sure you've you got all three phases uh, solid. All right, now let's get to the uh, transistor stage. Any questions on, any other questions on capacitors? Now we got the inverter section. The inverter section uses, and you will hear it either insulated gate bipolar transistors or isolated gate bipolar transistors. They're the exact same thing. Just two terms that people have, that some people use once and we use the other. And they, just like the diodes, are nothing more than a fancy switch. But they are what turn on and off to, with those pulses like we were seeing in the video to create that pulse width modulation. I'm going to back up to that main screen here in a second. So, remember I told you to check the, the diode bridge if your DC bus was not working or it didn't appear right? You could take an ohm meter and, and go one way and then reverse it. You can do the exact same thing on the output section. Disconnect the motor. Go from your T1 motor lead to your plus DC bus and reverse it, and just like with a diode, because these are just fancier diodes is what an IGBT is. They just are even more easily controlled. And you can check your, that's how you can check your IGBTs and find out if you got a bad IGBT or not. Take an ohm meter, so T1 to plus, 
reverse it. One way should be a short, one way should be open. Do the same for all three, T1, T2, and T3, and then do the same thing to the negative bus. T1 to the negative bus, reverse it. Now we can check all your IGBTs, and that's a simple way to check the IGBTs to see if you have a bad IGBT on the output of the drive. Now, once again, talking about fancy switch, everybody's heard the term pulse width modulation. What is that? As we talked about in the video, we control how often we're, we're creating that pulse and or how fast we're creating, how long we leave that, that IGBT on. So if you look on the left there, it's a real short pulse. If you notice the heights of all the uh, pulses are the same, it's inherent in DC. So we are actually pulsing DC out to that motor. And because uh, those pulses all have a higher peak, every single one of them, and they also get some overshoot inherent in DC. Whenever you turn a transistor on and off, there's a little overshoot. Yeah, what you would actually see is a little notches coming up off. So instead of seeing on a like on a 240 system, your peaks would be 240 to negative 240. So you're looking at 480. You might see or on 460, you'd see 920 if it's a pure sine wave. Because these are negative, because these are DC uh, pulsing DC out to the motor. Instead of 920, you know, instead of 920, you might see 1100 volts in that motor. The further the motor is from the drive, that 1100, if you have that motor five foot from the drive, it might be, you know, 1000, 1100 volts. Move that motor 500 feet from the drive. Now, those same exact motor, that same exact drive, but because of the distance and the way DC uh, works over, over distance, you may see 14, 1500 volts in that motor. And that creates a lot of extra heat. That is why it's so important to make sure that that motor is inverter rated, especially if you're putting a drive on an old motor. So if you got a customer that says, hey, I've never had a drive on this motor. I want to put the drive on this motor. Make sure you have something in writing somewhere where you recommend that they replace that motor. Because what sometimes will happen is the insulation of that motor can't take that extra peak to peak voltage, which creates more heat. And usually at the first turn, right when the windings come in, they make that hard 90. That's usually where they'll fail first. And that motor may last a week. It may last a few years. There's no way to know. But recommend that they make sure that they have an inverter rated motor. That, that insulation between the windings is, is set up in a way designed to handle that extra heat because we're pulsing DC out to that motor. So we're not sending a AC out, we're actually pulsing DC to make it look like AC on a power to that motor. And we control the width of the pulse and then you see how it builds up uh, the uh, motor waveform. Little pulse, small build, wider pulse, small build a little bit more. And that is the power underneath that curve that the motor sees that simulates to look like the waveform. Carrier frequency, we talked about that. Here's a, the, well, first, this would be the pulsing pattern. So if you're running 10 hertz, it might be one set of patterns. Running um, 20 hertz, you'd have double the pulses to create it. Running 60 hertz, we'd have, you know, six times the pulses to create it. And the carrier frequency we're talking about is how fast we turn those switches on and off. And you may run into this in an office setting where there's a motor in a roof or in a ceiling somewhere, and all of a sudden it's making a ton of noise because the carrier frequency is so high. It runs smoother, it runs quieter, but those carrier frequencies, like they were discussing because of the, the laminations of vibrating, it creates uh, a high-pitched noise, and you may get some people playing. So one thing we can do on a drive is we can change the carrier frequency. So instead of going 4,000 know, per second, or 4,000 kilohertz, we may change it down to two. So we can play with that. That's something you can call us or call you know Adam and we can talk to you about. But yeah, we can actually change the noise of the motor by changing how often we're turning these IGBTs on and off and that's called our carrier frequency. Pulse width modulation, we've kind of been over this. This is kind of just going into it more detail. Once again, the main thing to remember about IGBTs, they're fancy switches. They're either on or they're off. And what we're doing is controlling how often they're long they're on, and how long, how long they're off, and how often they're on and off. 
And once again, with an ohmmeter, you can check them very easily. All right, so that is the drive. We've got the diode bridge, taking AC, 1.44, around 1.44 times that, we'll get DC, a DC bus. We got the, the capacitors maintaining that DC bus and smoothing it out. And then we got the fancy switches, the IGBTs, the insulated gate, the gate bipolar transistors, turning on and off to create the output of the motor. The pulse width modulation, which you've probably heard in, in every motor. Now, so any questions about that? Any other questions? Now let's go to the post VFD section. So, on the output of the drive, sometimes, remember that input reactor we had, the, the input line reactor? We could also have an output line reactor. It's the same exact components, the same part. We uh, can do an output DVD T filter. We can have a disconnect switch for like a line of sight with the motor, uh, then obviously the motor, and then we can do multiple motors on one drive. We'll go over all of this. Output line reactors, once again, this is um, MTE is a very famous, makes, you know, very uh, common line reactor. It is the exact same components, basically a fancy coil of wire. And they, so it says using the same principle because they are the same. So what we're doing with the output line reactors, instead of getting rid of the harmonic distortion, we're now protecting that motor from uh, those high voltage peaks that I said, you know, when we, the DC, because the way we're pulsing those DC peaks, we're always the same height and then they get some overshoot. This will actually help squelch that down a little bit and kind of protect that motor from some of the heat. Anytime your motor is more than a couple hundred foot from the drive, we need to think about this. The front, once again, remember I said you may have a thousand volts if your motor's five foot from the drive, if you get the exact same motor and run it out to 500 foot, you may see 15, 1600 volts at the motor, that which generates more heat. So any, the, the rule of thumb is somewhere around, we say a couple hundred foot, this says 250. I've heard some manufacturers say 150. It really comes down to the quality of the motor. I get these questions all the time. Hey, can I, do I need a, a load reactor? Do I need an output reactor on this drive? My motor's 200 foot, 250 foot. What's the motor? You know, it's more of a motor. It's, it depends on, like I say, you know, a Yugo was a car but it wasn't a, a Mercedes or it wasn't a Lincoln. It, it met the requirements of getting people around, but the quality wasn't the same as say a Lincoln or a Mercedes or something like that. Not all motors are made the same. So Marathon is a motor I know they had, they were one of the best on the market as far as the quality of insulation they put in. They say their motors can handle eight, several hundred feet off the record, of course without putting any kind of protection on it. A cheaper motor, you get to 100 foot, and you may have issues. So really it depends on the motor. But the rule of thumb is you get a couple hundred foot, if the motor and the wire run is a couple hundred foot from the drive, I mean, which way you have to go to make the wire run, we need to talk about doing something to protect that motor from the from what we call DVDT, which is those high pulses of the DC that we're pulsing out to the motor. Regardless Another time, Regardless yes. of the motor, is it safe to say the shorter the distance, the better? The less that DC spike's going to be, the longer the motor's going to last, right? I'm sorry, you were kind of... <clears throat> the short, kind of so regardless of which motor you use, is it safe mm -hmm. to say that the, shortest, the shorter the distance, the better, because that will reduce that DC voltage spike at the motor, therefore allowing the motor to probably last longer? Yes. Yeah, you're you're not getting the uh, the shorter the the the, the terminal the line the uh, load excuse me the shorter the lead run the less that voltage is going to build up. So yeah, you don't need it. So that's why the rule of thumb usually, especially with the premium efficiency premium efficiency motors we have today, uh, you know, anything under a couple hundred foot, you most likely are okay. And the drive provides overload protection for the motor, so we're good there. But another time you may, even if it's only a 40 foot away, a lot of people don't realize this. You can actually run like three or four motors. You may have seen this on fan arrays where you may have four or five motors on one drive. So, and now think about those motors is they're gonna all run the same speed. 
and you don't want to shut one off and bring it back on when the drive's running. So they all got to shut off and on at the same time. But you also need to provide overload protection for each individual motor. Let's say you got five, 10 horse motors on a 60 horse drive. So that drive, that's just a big 50 horsepower motor. So if one of those motors starts to overload, we'll never know it because the others are fine. So you have to provide individual protection for the motors. And we recommend a line re a load reactor at that point because the motors running, even though they're the same motors, we're sending them the same frequency and the same voltage, mechanical differences, there'll be a slight difference in speed. It may be a half RPM, maybe, but that can cause some voltage feedback into the drive sometimes. It doesn't usually, but occasionally it will and cause problems. One thing you can take that from is put a load reactor on there. And so if you're running more than one motor on the drive, especially more than two or three, then we recommend you put a load reactor there. If you don't, you, if you're getting some over voltage nuisance strips and you got several motors on one drive, you probably need a, line, a load reactor out there. And of course we already, we beat this horse already, the long motor leads. So this keeps saying 250, uh, I've heard some manufacturers cause of, you know, all new equipment doesn't have as much metal in it as it used to. You get you an know, old U-frame motor, those things were huge. You put a new motor in there now, it's like a third the size. Because of the less metal in it, which could absorb some of that heat, you know, we're getting more and more, you know, saying, hey, make it, maybe come back to 200 or 150 feet before you start thinking about it. A lot of times if you've got a, especially like on a rooftop unit or something like that, or you got a, a, a drive in a control room and the motors are somewhere else, uh, regulations require you to have a line of sight disconnect in a lot of applications. So wherever that motor is, you gotta be able to see the disconnect. And it's fine. You open the disconnect, you work on the motor, you're fine. And the drive is okay with that. But what we want to see is that you take that something, use some auxiliary contacts on that disconnect so that it tells us somebody's out there that's opened the drive or opened the disconnect and forgot to shut off the drive first. Let us know that so we can see that and we'll trip the drive off on the fall. So the last thing we want you to do, so the drive, unless it's been set up for like a, a broken, which we can, but if it's not been set up for it, we'll just keep outputting voltage to the motor thinking it's running and just thinking, hey, it's really lightly loaded right now. And then somebody closes that disconnect and the drive's sitting there running, say, 45 hertz. That's basically you're doing an across the line start on that drive. And we don't like that. And it can damage the, uh, the power section of the drive. So if you do have a line of sight disconnect, we ask that you, at a minimum, put a, uh, uh, some auxiliary contacts to tell the drive to say somebody open the disconnect without shutting the drive off. And if you set that up for an auto restart on that fault, you could have it restart then just by closing the disconnect remotely. Could that be done? Well, I'm assuming if you're working on a motor, you've got the drive tagged out too. So if you're working on a motor, the drive should be shut off. You can set up a drive for auto restart, but this is not, wouldn't be one of the ones you would do that. We want the drive to shut off because that drive should not have power if you're out there working on the motor. All right, move through this. Motors and loads. I'm gonna cover this real quick because y'all deal mostly with variable torque loads. Um, there's basically two types of drives out there and the other bus drives we see in the industrial world are called constant torque. What that is, is like a conveyor. And you can see right there in these curves, constant torque, no matter if it's running, the conveyor is running 100 foot a minute or 1,000 foot a minute, the torque required to turn, move that conveyor is based off the load on the conveyor. But a variable torque load is your world, which would be a centrifugal pumps and fans. You think of a giant fan. Down here at the Liberty Tunnels in Pittsburgh, we got our drives on those, they're like 10 foot diameter fans. You can literally turn those fans with, it, with your hand when there's no power and they're not moving you know because there's no reason there's nothing there you're basically overcoming the friction of the bearings if, if the fan's balanced you take any fan you can turn it with your finger and that's what you see on this curve 
that the percent speed when it's very low, the torque required to turn it is very low. That's called variable torque. But as we get, as we get to the top, a little change in speed is a huge change in torque. This is also, if you look at that curve, that's 100% speed, 100% torque. Well, we get the question all the time, hey, can we run that motor at 70 hertz to get a little more flow, a little more air? Depends. Once again, little change in speed up here is a huge change in power, which is a huge change in current. You may overload that motor and overload that drive at 70 or 75 hertz. You also need to look at your uh, fan, it's your uh, fan curves or your pump curves. Because there's a certain point going up on that variable torque curve where it might be 70, 75 uh, hertz, where all of a sudden that torque is building, 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 and then it drops off to almost zero. And that's when you're cavitating if you got a pump. But you try to overspeed to it much, there's a certain point that you can that you cannot overspeed it to. And you, the drive, as long as the motor can handle it, the drive can handle it, if the driving motor is big enough to go above the 60 hertz range, it really comes down to the fan and pump curves to where you can go with that. So we get that question all the time about, can I go faster than 60 hertz? If the motor can handle the, load, the extra load and the drive is sized for the extra load, then you gotta look at the fan or the pump curves to make sure you're, at some point, you're going to increase flow and it's going to go away. You can also just do that by touch and fill if you want to, you know, like keep slowly increasing it and see what point you lose in flow. But once again, the motor has to be oversized usually in those applications. And that's what we're talking about. Most variable torque drives because once again, it takes almost no torque. We're, we're 110% uh, for 60 seconds. Of the, so it takes almost no torque to get that drive running. So you, whereas a constant torque drive, we actually have 150% overload capability for 60 seconds because you've got to get a heavier, got a lot of torque at low speed. All right, anything, questions on variable torque, overspeed in the drive, fan, or anything like that? You know, once again, make sure you check the fan curves. I want to go over the motor nameplate here. And the reason I want to do this is not what, this name, but I got to get another picture. This name has got way too much information on it. I really want to know. So you get a call. The customer says, I got a 10 horsepower drive or 10 horsepower motor on a fan. And I would like to put a drive on. Somebody tell me the questions you would ask him. What do you need to know? There's three basic things. Volts, amps. What's that? FLA, the volts, amps, and horsepower. All right, whoever said amps, I love you. Volts is important, obviously, because and this actually gets us every once in a while because motor most motors are rated 234 or you know 234 460. Drives or not, whatever you put in is what you're getting out. So you, you have to, yes, so voltage is very important. Horsepower gets us in the ballpark. Full load amps, whoever said that, that is the most important thing you need to know. Because the full load amps, depending on the type of motor, can change. A 10 horsepower, severe duty, 900 RPM motor is going to draw a lot more current than an 1800 RPM Nemo B motor. Every drive is sized based off of a Nemo B 1800 RPM motor. You start lowering those speeds and, and getting more severe duty rate to higher, higher service factor motors. The current, the, the full load amps will go up. Sometimes, if you got a 10 horse motor, you may not need to put a 15 horse drive on it because it's a 600 RPM special duty motor that draws more current. The current is so important to know in the application. And you also need to know if it's a constant torque or variable torque, but in your, your world, it's almost always variable torque. So, and I'll give you an example of that. Um, Water project here in, the, in uh, Pennsylvania. We had 125 horsepower configured drives with disconnects and, and input filters and output. I mean, these things were big buildups, tens of thousands of dollars per each. We kept asking the engineer, water, what's the full load amps on the motors? Never get it to us. It's in writing. We've asked it multiple times. They're just standard motors. Don't worry about it. They were a special low RPM motor 
if we actually when when they got we saw the motors we needed to go from 125 to size the drive to handle that 125 horsepower severe duty slow rpo motor we need to go all the way up to 175 horsepower problem was those drives are sitting there without those uh that paper trails it would have been my distributor it had been the distributor's issue or you know the contract but we had to pay for it we're begging the engineers for the information they never got it to us it was on them so full loadouts all that to say whoever said full loadouts thank you you get the hat and that was perfect energy savings how do we use drives well we're going back to uh, real quick on the cost of the torque Cost of torque applications, drives don't save any energy. They're there to do work. Pumps and fans, if you're trying to convince a customer, centrifugal pumps, if you're trying to convince a customer to put a, um, a, a drive on a pump, a pump or a fan, open up his dampers, you know, all that stuff so he can control flow with a drive. The rule of thumb, because of that variable torque curve at the top there, we see it's almost a vertical line. 20% reduction in speed, which is if you slow it down to 48 hertz, will cut the power to run that motor in half. And we actually have software we can show this. You can show, you know, depending on your damper positioning and stuff like that, we can show you a payback analysis for these drives. And I've seen seven or six figure drives that pay back in less than two years. And some have paid, but most don't pay back in less than a year. And now that energy savings because you can open the dampers and control flow with the drive or, or open the valves on a pump system. Now that money goes in thousands of dollars a year goes back into the customer's pocket. And we actually, if you need to convince a customer that he needs drives, we have software that can show that payback analysis. It does a very, it's, it's very good software. It does a very good job of showing it with charts and graphs and all the bean counting. We actually had a um, ID fan in the steel mill over in Coshocton, and there was a rebate money on the line from the state, and the state required some kind of analysis to show what the potential savings were. We actually used our software package, and, and we sent that to them, and it's free software. They actually accepted that as the, the, um, the pre-project analysis. So it's very powerful, very good software. It does its job well. But that's why we use drives on, because back in the day, you see uh, bypass units. Who still sees bypass units? We all do. We don't need them anymore, but we still see them. The problem is, bypass units came into play because of this energy savings. In the 80s and 90s, when drives first came out, if you got six months of the year out of a drive, you were happy. But you saved so much money, so we put a bypass unit, which would put a cross line starter, in, you know, right there with the drive. So you can take the drive out, pull it out, repair it, run the motor across the line, get the drive repaired, and put it back in, and start saving money again. Nowadays, drives are so reliable, and the systems are designed not to be run at 60 hertz anymore. You really don't need the bypass unit, even though we see them all the time. But it's the energy savings that does that, and it's only on the the pump or fan because of that variable torque curves. Any questions? All right. All right, so that's the basics of a drive. We discussed the input side, we discussed the output side, we discussed what the drive's like, and we went over the basics. A little bit of troubleshooting. Now I'd like to open it up for questions. Is there any type of applications or anything like that that you've seen or that, uh, that uh, let me quit sharing my screen here. Any applications or anything or any specific things you guys are interested in or any questions you've got? No? I did heard somebody, somebody mentioned restarts. Does anybody, does anybody uh, not understand what we mean by automatic restarts? No, everybody good? Yeah, um, I looked at a job where they had um, 
uh, by several large air conditioning units. And uh, some of them were newer, some were older. And working with a guy from Johnstone um, with those brand of drives actually. And um, he told me that I could not change the older models over for some reason because uh, the motor was different and wouldn't accept it. Well, what were they bypass units? What were you talking about? No, just a, you know, like a three ton blower, let's say, on a, on a commercial unit. But you couldn't change the drives over, he said. No, some of the motors couldn't take a drive, wouldn't accept it. Yes, what yes that's about? what we are talking about earlier about the insulation. Oh, is that what it is? Inverter. Insulation? Yes. Or the, the older motors don't have the installation to take the extra heat okay. of the output of the computer. All right. I didn't know what he was, what, that, what the difference was between the two. So it's insulation. Yeah, that's where we were talking earlier about how that peak to peak voltage is higher. Yeah. Which creates more heat in the yeah. motor. Okay. A lot of older, especially older, cheaper motors, they can't handle that heat because the insulation is not uh, good enough insulation yeah, all to all handle the extra all heat. The newer ones had the right motor, but the old, two older ones did not. Yeah, so yeah, you gotta add the right motor and stuff like that. What's the story on grounding rings? <coughs> oh. What's that? On the shaft grounding rings? Yeah, we, uh, we're just getting uh, some corona effect. And then you, it, it, where you see, basically those, cause we're switching the uh, drives so fast, high frequency is, uh, actually tries to get out of the insulation and tries to run outside the, so if there's any kind of nick or anything in the windings, you know, that we're at normal for switching frequency, you don't see it, but when, because we're switching those IGTs so fast, it can create what's called a corona effect and currents can get outside the windings and they'll, they'll get into the bearings and usually they'll, they'll distort the bearings. What? And I've, you don't, there's no way to detect to, to, that I've seen to say, yes, it's going to happen here. I've seen buildings with several drives with no issues. And in one motor, they put a drive on it and it has issues. But they do grind, grounding rings now. So what you do is you, you're taking when those currents, those, it's, those uh, rotating currents get into the bearings. You put a grounding ring on the shaft that sends it shorts it to ground so it doesn't stay in the bearings and destroy the bearings. So when you're designing one, a system or designing Getting the idea that you're going to add a drive to an existing motor, um, you've got options like the inlet line reactor, the output line reactor, and grounding rings, and those are all just good enhancements to minimize issues down the road, correct? That to minimize issues down the road, but they still, if it's an older motor, it's still not going to help with that uh, weaker it's insulation. It's not going to help with like the insulation, would. right? Yeah. But yeah, so the. Um, the line reactor will help you because it keeps, it reduces the harmonic distortion. So you can put more drives on or more LED lighting, whatever it is, before you have issues. So it, it'll keep you from the, from the tipping point. And yeah, and then the load reactor will obviously help you take the motor, whether it's a hundred foot or 200 foot, you know, it, as long as you're minimizing that DVDT, which is the differential voltage over time, which is basically those peak to peaks. That, that, so yeah, it never hurts to have it, it's just not always necessary. With the hot weather, if there's a electrical voltage brownout, how does that affect the drives? Uh, depending on the severity of the brownout, they can actually damage a drive. Normally, uh, if they're just quick brownouts, we won't have any issues. Uh, we can set the drives up to do like low voltage drive throughs. You can actually set the drive to do different things depending on um, how, you know, if you're having a lot of brownouts, we can actually change the, how, how the drive reacts to it. We can actually have the drive restart as long as that DC bus, you know, everybody looks, you know, you see in the drive, they got that little red light if the DC bus is still energized. If there's enough, because the capacitors are slowly discharging, as long as those capacitors are discharging, the control circuit has enough as it can be energized for us as a 24 volt circuit, we can actually um, have the drive, as soon as that voltage comes back up, restart. 
And there's about three different modes we can do that in, depending on you know the severities of the brown rats you're getting and how often you get them, what you, what you need with the dry rat. So yeah, there's we can handle those uh, to a, to an extent, but and we can set we can adjust how the dry reacts to it. Let's say the voltage is supposed to be 208 and it's 185 for 45 minutes in a row. Say again? The voltage is supposed to be 208, but for 45 minutes straight, it's 185. Because the, the electric company can't generate enough electricity. Well, the drive is set up to handle, you know, the 208 drive minus 10%. So you can get 28 volts. So 188, you're probably gonna be okay. So that's within the, the the plus or minus 10 percent that we have on the drives okay. so if you have a 280 volt drive they can handle you know down to like 180. Okay. tony how so does, to cause issues it's got to be really low tony how does it handle phase imbalance as far as voltage goes a phase imbalance uh of like an open delta circuit or something like that that we don't handle that very well at all uh we like um fairly phase balanced circuitry or uh, phases coming in. Um, there's, I've seen like an open delta systems that the drives will run on for years and all of a sudden they can get some kind of imbalance and then the drives won't work. We really do not do well with, with unbalanced systems. Does it have a protective device within the drive typically to shut it down? We will, uh, usually what it'll be like, um, we'll get enough DC bus ripple, then it'll be like a single phasing or something like that that we'll see. But there's not always, uh, we don't always pick it up. There's really nothing, we don't have really, power, we're not monitoring the power coming in the drives, unfortunately. Okay, so. It would make the cost too so, much, so. Does it actually make sense to put a um, phase monitor on that inlet voltage then? If you've got it, if you've got a severe issue with it, yes. Uh, and that's one of the things people would do is buy a phase monitor to put on it. Because once again, we don't put them on the drives because it would make the cost of drives too much. Is that an option? Not in a drive, no. Okay. You can get it into a build-up panel. You can ask us to add one. Uh, and then you, we'll, we'll build one with it. And it's just a, we'll buy one and put it in the panel. If you want a, like a, a NEMO 12 or 3R or a NEMO 1 panel with a disconnect and maybe a line reactor on one giant enclosure, we can do that, yes. So it's just as easy to put an ICM on it and be done with it, right? Yeah, it's probably easier for you to do it yourself. Okay. I put in phase monitors for the whole building and I set it real fast so if you get a voltage sag, uh, even like one second, it'll, it'll call me and tell me. If it resets, fine, but if it stays, then I check it out. Uh, the electric company yeah. puts capacitors on the line because there's a, a lot of motors on the line. Like in our neighborhood, the, one of the, the B phase fuse on the capacitor bank is down. I called it in Sunday, but they'll, they'll get around to it whenever. Sometimes the capacitor bank will be down for months. I had one yeah, they do. It's called a uh, induct or uh, reactive compensation. I actually used to work with Mitsubishi, and we that's what we did. We put capacitors or inductors on there for that. You have to cap. I've seen some of those cap banks that people are just like in buildings. They have their own. And they they take them out of service, but they have so many issues with them. But but yeah, if the power companies are notorious for not coming out to you know because you can still ride with the cap bank out. It's just not going to be there if you need it. Oh, but and then one, if one fuse is down out of the three, that messes up the signal that goes back to the substation. So it doesn't know, you know, are we too high or too low voltage? Should I jack it up, jack it down? I don't know. Getting the bad signal. Yeah. But that would be more something on the power side coming into the building. The drive wouldn't see that unless you had the issue inside the building as well. Any other questions? Bunch of heads, head shaking. Tony, thanks again. Well, I, I apologize once again for the mix up. Uh, hopefully, you got something out of this. Uh, I'll promise you I'll be there for the next one. <laughs>
Sounds and if good. you ever have me back, I'd like to meet everybody. Uh, but uh, enjoyed the time. Uh, good questions. If you've got anything for any other questions in the future, don't hesitate. Adam, make sure they all can uh, or make sure they all have my contact information. Okay. And uh, if anybody's got any questions, don't hesitate to give me a call. Oh, I'm in Pittsburgh. I'm not far away. Appreciate the time. I spend more time in Cleveland than I do uh, Pittsburgh anyway. More, more y'all over there than over here. Next time you're in town, stop by, okay? I will definitely do that. I'll let you know. Thanks again, Tom.